So Dan, you, you might have heard something on the internet about this new Ford Bronco. Are, are you aware of this vehicle? The Bronco, you know, that does sound vaguely familiar. Like I've heard of the Bronco. Uh, you know, is that a new, is that a new vehicle, Mike? Is that something new that's coming they, out? They, they had it years ago in 65 oh. and then then there was this guy named oj who did a bad thing and tried to get oh out of yeah yeah right? yeah but yeah, that was that yeah was, bronco that was years ago years right ago. right you know the play it feels I like mean, yesterday you know yeah, for guys all right i know i know, I know. I know. I was, we're dating ourselves here i get it but yeah of course the bronco the god blessed bronco like what have you heard about the bronco mike well, I I know I I and I know because I saw this back in July that Ford just released a brand new Bronco, one that you know it didn't really didn't really look like the whole OJ thing, but more along the lines of the original kind of sixty five, sixty six, sixty seven, like the first gen Bronco. It's it's kind of it's it's kind of macho. I'm not gonna lie to you. Hey, look, I'll be the first one to say it. Uh, you know, the original Bronco. Um, I was amazed as a kid growing up how long that little box actually lasted right i mean that was in well into the 70s before that second gen came out and then that kind of looked like it had that dent side look to it remember that oh, you yeah. know, it looked like the sixth gen fords it had that body style sort of you know oh yeah so yeah i'm glad they went back to the original one that's cool yeah so because of that i did a little digging and I reached out to our folks at Ford, and I was actually able to get a hold of Mr. Mark Gruber, who is the uh, – he's the U.S. Consumer Marketing Manager for Ford and one of the heads of the quote-unquote Bronco Underground. That guy. That guy. Okay. Very underground. Very hush-hush, right? Mm -hmm. Like that guy – you got to know somebody to know somebody to get a hold of Mark Gruber. And you sound like you're the guy who might have been I, the guy who got the, to the guy. I knew the guy who knew that guy. Ah, that's great. That's great. So are we going to be talking to Mark Gruber today? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, we got the guy. We got him. We we, we got Mark Mark Gruber. It's good. He's going to talk to us about how the Bronco and why the Bronco took, I don't know, 24 years to get back into production. Um, but, you know, and, and that's so he's coming up on this episode of the barbecue. But then also on this episode, as we always do, right, we found an amazing Bronco from our classified, the Hemings classified right? Of which we have 25,000 cars in our classified as well as on our auction site. So uh, if anybody's trying to sell a car or buy a car, you're just not going to find anything better than what we have at the Hemmings, right? That's right. And a bunch of Broncos. I mean, I've seen a bunch of those things on, you know, on our Hemmings.com, right? And, and every single one of them, I, I want a piece of every one of them. You know, like I want my own Bronco. I want my own new Bronco. That's what I want. I don't, and, and here's the thing, Mike, I don't really like or pine after or lust after a whole lot of brand new cars. Very picky about that. As you can tell by the, by the heat behind me, you know, I, I kind of live in the past a little bit, right? But this new Bronco, that's one that I want. You know, now that I've seen the pictures of this stupid thing, I want one bad. Yeah, and this is, this is the problem because, as you know, my daily driver, right, is an OJ-style Bronco. Oh, yeah. No, I've seen that. We've ridden in it. That, I mean, ridden that's in it. I'll tell you what, uh, it's probably one of my favorite tractors out there. It, it's a it's a good old it's a good old thing. It is. Yeah. There you go, folks. Um, we're going to take, uh, you know, maybe a two or three second break. And then we're going to come back with, again, Mark Gruber, who is the U.S. Consumer Marketing Manager for Bronco, one of the heads of the Bronco Underground, and uh, talk a little more about that 71 we found in the Hemings Classified. So can't wait. Can't wait. Since this was a Bronco episode, um, I pulled the car up. Dan pulled last week. Yes. I'll pull this one. Uh, and I tried to make it as pure as I can. It's a 1971 Ford Bronco. Pretty much it's been redone. It has been restored. Beautiful red integrated roll cage. Uh, looks like a 302 yeah, under the hood. Nut and bolt restoration, you know. I, yeah. I, I think I see some things that might be questionable there as far as restoration as opposed to just new stuff. Like yeah. seat belts. I don't know. Yeah, what I don't do you, remember. How far do you go with nut and bolt? How do far how far uh, when you describe it that way? I don't know. That's that's a good question. So, you Dan, know. let me let me ask you. So when you look at this, right? Yeah. Um, is this like these older Broncos? And I know you're an old Ford truck guy. I am. Um, did these Broncos still appeal to you? Like if you had the opportunity to yeah. buy this or the new Bronco, which direction do you think you'd go? 
Oh man, that's a good question. Well, here's what I will I will I will answer that question with a little anecdotal story. So one of the things that I have all I don't know why you never get those things that are stuck in your head, those little like memory worms that never leave you, and you have no story idea why life. you remember stuff. Right? Okay. Yeah. So when I was in high school, I must have been in say ninth grade. So that's oh I don't know early eighties, and a buddy of mine, one of my best friends, was talking about a Bronco that his dad had that he wanted. And he showed me a picture of this thing. Of course, it's the early 80s. So he had a, a picture of it, uh, like a photograph of the thing. Mm -hmm. And his dad owned a, I want to say it was a 75 or a 76, maybe something like that. Okay. Uh, first gen, first gen yep. Bronco. Yep. And in those days, as a kid, I knew of the second gen Broncos. And I right. knew that the second generation Broncos looked very much like the dent side Ford sixth gen pickup trucks it was based on sure. that f100 you know f150 uh platform it was a full-size truck right in a bronco form right so i didn't realize that that first gen had crept so far into the 70s so in my head i'm thinking that's not that's got to be oh yeah, yeah that, that's a that's got to be a late 60s and he has said no it's not it's a 75 or 76 whatever it yeah. was and he and i almost it almost came to blows right there <laughs> in the lunchroom almost came to blows because I was convinced that that body style could not have lasted into the seventies the yeah, way that, run. right. And it was a long run. It was a long okay, run. So right. to, to make that answer even longer, you know, I would, I, I have a hard time with the Bronco itself and the new one that just came out. The new one is so kick-ass that I think yeah. I would have to have a new one. And that goes against every fiber of my old man heart and 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 my being to actually yeah. say i'd want something new as opposed to something old because you know as well as i do what i drive so yeah, that's a big deal that's that's a true testament to mark and his design team that came up with something that i would i would absolutely forego the vintage model the original first gen model to own a new yeah. one if i had to make that choice you know yeah and you know what Boom. i'm just gonna leave that down no, nah, dude, you're not wrong. I mean, I, you right. know, as the owner of a 96 Bronco the last year of the Broncos, yeah. um, I would, I mean, if somebody were to sell me, you know, yeah. which one would you rather have? I'm not going to say I would sell mine right. because I just like it, but the new ones. Yeah. I think they knocked it out of the park with it the really amount did. of heritage that they, they yeah. infused in it. And especially with the, uh, the amount of tech and off-road capability. So I, I'm, I'm really excited to see this thing in person um so yeah. obviously before in, in about a second or two we're going to jump in with mr mark gruber from ford but as always i want you to email guys i want you to email us questions hot rods you want to talk about to hot rod barbecue at hemmings.com um let us That's know what you want to talk about t-r-o-d-b-b-q hot rod bbq, BBQ. yeah at hemmings.com B right um let us know what you want to talk about and yeah. we'll do that because that's what Dan and I do. We um, we what? We promise. We promise. To yeah, do we that. we we do promise to do that. Those are not promises that are hard to keep. We we can you know just stare. At, I can stare at a wall and talk to it. So you know <laughs> that's not an issue. You know. <laughs> so and there you go. So we're gonna be back in a few moments with uh, again Mark Gruber from Ford, head of the Bronco Underground, one of the creators of the new Bronco, um, along with his team. So. Uh, We'll talk to you guys in a few seconds. See you soon. I just thought of something, man. Do you know, do you know who actually has more parts for sale than even Hemmings? And when I say more parts, I mean millions of parts. Do you know are, who are, you, are you are you alluding to somebody else has I, more I parts than us? Are, are we talking like millions of parts from maybe millions over fifteen hundred different manufacturers? Yeah, and not just over 1500 manufacturers but parts for things like performance cars and hot rods and racing and even restoration parts restoration parts michael are we talking about parts so they have stuff for paint body supplies and they also have like tools that i can use to paint my car tools okay now we're gonna we're getting close and i'm gonna give you one last clue huh. fast and free shipping on anything over 99 dollar orders that, that's so got to telling me that's got to you're telling me all I have to do is spend a mere ninety nine dollars to get my stuff to almost Free. anywhere in the continental United States. And on top of that, I will get top notch service. Is that what you're saying? I mean, yes, to all of those things, all of the, all of the above 
is one big giant fat yes. Do you, guess? I want you to take one guess who this might be. Man. Who are we talking about? I mean, I've used I've used companies in the past, and many of those companies have never, ever lived up to what we no, just talked about. I, that's it's rare. You'll never find another one. Who might that? Let me be? let me ask you one more thing. Okay, one more. If if I am not one hundred percent satisfied with these yeah. products, the prices, yeah. and the services, will I get my money back, Dan? Will I? You will get your money back before you even send them an email or place a slightly angry phone call. The money's already there. It's already there? When you just think that you might want to return something. Well, you know what? I'm going to take a guess. And even though that last part might not be 100% correct, but it's pretty close to correct. Right. I'm going to go with Summit Racing. Oh, you na- it's like you read my mind. I, I- it's crazy, right? It's like you read my mind. I barely had to say anything, and you knew it was Summit. I right? just it, I, it came to me. Summit, it, I knew this. That's right. Oh. Summit Racing, fifteen hundred plus manufacturers, millions of parts, free shipping over ninety nine dollars, and oh. on top of that, Mike, I'm going to blow your mind with this one. Their absolute one hundred percent handshake guarantee. You know what that means? Wow. Okay, what That's... that means? Like, get the sit down for this. What I got it. I'm, I'm is kidding. that if you're not 100 percent, 100 percent happy with uh-huh. anything, anything that you that they do for you and vice versa, money back guarantee. Why would you go anywhere else? You don't. You do not go anywhere else. That's the whole no. thing about Summit. They are built to not go anywhere else. Once you enter the Summit universe, you never have to leave. Just bring a blanket, bring some, you know, bring a lunch, and never leave. That's what Summit Racing is all about. It's summitracing.com. You go, you thank us for sending you there, (laughs) and you send us some free stuff after you place your order. Because here's the last thing, Mike. All you have to do, I kid you not, just think about Summit and your parts show up. That's how fast this stuff gets to you. This is what I've been dreaming about my whole life. (sighs) I'm worn out. I'm worn out. Okay. Long day. I guess we better get back to the show. Yeah, we get back to the show. Okay, so we are back with Mark Gruber, U.S. Consumer Marketing Manager for Ford. Is that correct, Mark? Would that be the correct title for you? Let's go with that. Yep, I like Let's, it. I like that. Let's go with that. Okay, so obviously the world has gone a little bananas, right, since the Bronco has been introduced. Um, everything from trans, um, from a, a virtual introduction was really kind of the first of its kind to happen for any major vehicle launch mm-hmm. to everybody and their brother going, yeah, I think I'm going to rethink that Jeep purchase and put some money down on a Bronco. Mm-hmm. So you need to talk to us about how this truck came about, because as a Bronco owner, I looked at this thing and I was like, son of a bitch. I was like, they got it so right. Not a little right. True. So right. Mm-hmm. So explain that a little bit so how seven did that times whole over project yeah start? yeah <laughs> how did like i know you guys have been working on this for at least 15 18 20 years right <laughs> right yeah it's uh you know bronco uh went out of production in 1996 and uh there's been a strong desire from enthusiasts and frankly people inside of ford ever since then to bring it back because there's just nothing else like it within the Ford showroom. And uh, it's a pretty unique vehicle that strikes yep. an emotional chord with people. So there's been a lot of efforts to bring it back in the past. And this most recent one started about five years ago and uh, you know, really just started with the, what's the Bronco brand all about? What do we need to do to make a, a new Bronco and what's today's customer want. And it's been a right. tireless effort uh, by the team to, to try to bring it back. When, when you guys started, so when, when the Raptor first came out, right, that was kind of Ford's first foray into, you know what, no holds barred off road. We're going to make something that no one's ever seen before from an OEM. Yeah. And then again, we heard rumblings of the Bronco coming out and everybody's going, I wonder if they're going to kind of follow suit with that and make it that hardcore. And I think, as enthusiasts, that's what we were all hoping, right? So how yeah. much of how much of that kind of um, that Raptor spirit did you guys look at and say, okay, this is where we need to go with this truck? Yeah, hundred percent. So yeah, I had the uh, the pleasure of uh, launching the Raptor. I was the F one hundred and fifty marketing manager back 
uh, then. And uh, so I kind of led the development and uh, launch of that product. And uh, on Bronco, there was what we saw, a couple of the interesting things was we went back to the Ford archives. It's just a treasure trove of uh, all the information. We literally had the yeah. original approval letter signed by Lee Iacocca. Oh, we wow. had the original clay photos of the very first concept vehicles. We had, you know, just the whole initial strategy. Yeah. And we wanted to make sure we really understood the essence of what Bronco was. We talked to, you know, enthusiasts and expert panels and all kinds of folks. And we wanted to make sure, first and foremost, we delivered a Bronco. And when you yeah. look back at Bronco, it was always this um kind of all around or off-road vehicle the original code name of the very first bronco actually was goat and at that point it stood for goes over any terrain and that was okay. the original code name back in the 60s of the first bronco okay and so we kind of started with that and then we also looked at you know bronco was kind of the second horse if you will within the ford stable right you had mustang that was the on road right on version and then Bronco uh, was very intentionally set up as kind of the off-road you know fun and freedom vehicle and right there was this also this element of built for tough and right. the toughness of f-series so you know to your point we kind of took the you know the what Bronco always was this goat or goes over any terrain you got the fun and freedom and uh, you know performance of Mustang going fast and then you've got the toughness of f-series and you know certainly yep. the credibility of raptor on top of it that fits in there and trying to mesh that together to be what's uniquely bronco there hey mark this was there ever a discussion internally because you know we looked back you know historically at the bronco and there were like the two generations of it right there was the first and the second right. did you was there like a real conversation at all about which you know, what well i guess a two-part question actually one how nostalgic were you going to go or was it going to be like a brand new looking thing or two if you already assumed you were going to go down that path did was there a real discussion between first and second gen as far as inspiration with this That's thing a great question no, it was pretty clear that we knew the equity and the real passion was in that first generation from sure. 77. Yep. You see the used vehicle prices and what those things are going for. Just crazy, you know. Yeah, it's insane. Yeah. Back in the day that these things are going for what they are. So um, we really knew that the Gen... On Hemmings, I'm sure. Right. The, the <laughs> Gen right. 1 was clearly where we wanted to start um, in terms of you know, the vehicle imagery, um, because that's where we thought the, the equity and passion really was. Not that there's a piece of Bronco in all those different generations, but the Gen 1 was where we started, and they literally took our design director's classic Gen 1 Bronco and digitally scanned it um, to understand okay. the proportions of the vehicle and some of the surfaces and use that as a starting point for this new Bronco. How important was it so you guys had been working on this and developing and developing. So did you guys just sit back and giggle when Chevy released, released the blazer? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you can answer that because I, I know we did. And we were like, I mean, we may or may not have, I don't know. <laughs> I can probably answer that multiple different ways. Uh, I would say that uh, that's what we did not want to do on Bronco. Um, there was right. a lot of fear of, you know, let's make sure that, it's a true Bronco living up to the name of what Bronco is all about with open air and, you know, the customization and the off-road capabilities. So, you know, whenever we needed to, frankly, we would remind each other on the team that we did not want to do, uh, you know, a product that was not true to the Bronco name. And we spent right. a lot of time studying, frankly, others that have tried to compete in this space and, uh, I think you could probably say failed, um, like even the FJ Cruiser, um, you know, yeah. strong brand in Toyota, a lot of similarities with a strong brand that, you know, enthusiasts wanted to bring back, yep. pent up demand. Uh, and then quite frankly, after two model years, it fell off a cliff in terms of the yeah. sales. And so we really tried to spend a lot of time understanding what went wrong there so we wouldn't repeat it we didn't you know want to have too much pride to say oh we're gonna we've got this right. and we're just gonna put a new bronco out there we really wanted to study um the market study the customer 
And, um, you know, I think it was, it, obviously it's, it's working out pretty well for us uh, so far. That makes when, sense. I mean, do you guys look back also at, you know, the early Baja days? And I mean, clearly, right? I mean, we, we look at this thing going, oh, yeah, we see we see some strop DNA in this thing. You know, yeah. we see we see some, uh, you know, some off road stuff, some early mint 400 influence yeah. here. Right. I mean, did it seem so obvious to us? But I mean, did, I don't know. Was, did anyone in your group ever pause and question that that direction? It didn't it doesn't seem like you would. You know, when it's so true to the brand, I don't think it really could be questioned, but, you know, 100%, that's where we, we started, right? We, in the archives as well, right? All the rich history of uh, Big Ole and, you know, right. the Rod Hall, uh, Larry Miner, yep. the overall Baja, and, right? Then we, the first thing we showed was the new Bronco R, which was providing a glimpse of the new Bronco, but yep. that's where we started, right? We literally started with the racing routes and even had the granddaughter of Rod Hall, Shelby Hall, be one of our drivers on the new Bronco. So making that connection and reminding people that Bronco has a super rich history in terms of, uh, you know, it was the first sport utility vehicle, literally coined the term. Oh, yeah. And all the racing history, because uh, a lot of people don't remember that part of Bronco. And to be authentic, we wanted to start there. And then we're going to start building the new brand from uh, from there. When when you were starting to go into the kind of customizability of of the Bronco itself, right? Everything from the removable hardtop to the removable doors to add to the doors that you can also buy from Ford with the see through pass, so you can get you know air coming in and everything else to the camera mounts to every. I mean, was it literally sitting down and saying, okay? let's just throw the gauntlet at this thing and let's see what everybody really wants. And how much of that design philosophy and design structure did you pull from watching people on social media and seeing what they were doing with their trucks, regardless of, of what it was, whether it was a Raptor or, or whatever it was? Yeah, yeah, I think it was a really interesting um, process. Um, and it was something that we wanted, um, quite frankly, it wasn't just marketing or design or engineering, it was the whole team who really immersed themselves. And it sounds really simple, but we just spent a ton of time with the customer, whether that be online, in person, in their house, we basically tried to study that customer inside and out. And again, our competitors, we even looked at outside industries we looked at you know side by sides to see what we can learn yeah. from because that's got a, a pretty thrilling and fun uh, yeah. experience off-roading and uh, if the markets exploded there and we saw a lot of similarities back to you know a little bit of raptor ask in some regards mm -hmm. we studied the marine uh you know boating as far as hey if you're going to have an open air vehicle it's going to get wet inside. So what do you do to make sure the switches and stuff like that and the seats, you know, what do you yeah. do with that? Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, you know, we, we also tried to, again, not think we had all the answers. We brought in uh, an expert panel from day one of aftermarket customizers, Bronco historians, off right. racers, and got their advice as well. So we, we tried to, turn over every possible stone to really uh, study the market. And then from there, once you had a firm understanding of the customer that the entire team had, then everybody could start to, you know, innovate um, from there to say, here's what this customer has to do. But it had to be such a, a deep understanding of the customer by the entire organization. These weren't made up kind of marketing customers. These were like real customers. We actually right. had five, five different customers that we identified because it's not a, a single, you know, customer like who's in the off-roading and some people just want to go to the beach. Right. There's different sure. customers out there. So we identified five and we studied it literally for a couple of years, every which way we could. Wow, that's, I mean, some people just want to go to Trader Joe's in one. You know what I mean? Yeah, like, like that's just totally. You know, that's about as much adventure as they want, but they want to do it in the Bronco, right? Right. Yeah, because they want that imagery still of you know they could do that, but they're not. That's going. right. That's yeah. Not. But, how did but, you find these people? Like, I, I'm always curious when we hear about these kinds of exercises. You know, how do you look at the you know the United States and and figure out some way to talk to the right people about what you're about to embark on? That seems like that just seems like some dark art to me. Right, like some magic. Uh, it's uh, I don't know. It's um, it's probably just 
typical kind of marketing, right? And market research in terms yeah. of identifying different, what we call screeners of who you're looking for. And it's not just, you know, age and income. It's, you know, it's everything from attitudinally, you know, how these people think and what they value. Um, but you, you know, we would know stuff like Colorado and a California would be key markets, right? And sure. So mm -hmm. super high level, you would know that. And you know that these are for people that want to kind of get into the outdoors and right. need a vehicle to satisfy uh, that or to be able to get them there and their gear there to the trailhead. And so you can ask questions like that with our market research partners to try to identify people like that, that need a vehicle like this. Uh, and then you kind of go from there to, uh, again, do different types of research, everything from observational to focus groups. Yep. We even joined different social clubs uh, for people in this space to understand it. We tried to do everything we possibly could to, uh, to understand this market and this customer. And we thought there was a big opportunity because we were coming back into the market after about 25 years. Yeah. An opportunity for a lot of innovation. And quite frankly, when we talked to the customers, a lot of them didn't even know that there could be something different or better because they were just so used to the status quo of what was out there. They were like, oh, what do you mean? Yeah, I, I take the doors off and, you know, it took them forever and they hardly ever did it because it was such a pain in the butt. Yeah. But once you showed them something better, they're like, oh, wow, that's, that's pretty cool. I didn't realize you could do that. Um, so, right. When you just ask them, you know, what they liked or didn't like, frankly, a lot of them will be like, oh, everything's great. But once you got into it more, you could understand, again, some of their pain points as, as we Right. Mentioned. Was the, so Bronco is as, tradi you know, has always traditionally been a two-door model, right. right? It's always had two doors. So was the new Bronco always to be conceived as a two and a four door model. And is that what the customers were looking for? Be like, yeah, we need this versatility as, as a four door as well. Yeah. You know, we were, the team was super passionate that it had to have a two door, even though the market is 80, 85% four doors um, at this point, but just given the, you know, the heritage of that. And, you know, when you're looking for an image and kind of capability leader, the two door is kind of where it's at. Um, yeah. So we were passionate that even though it wasn't big sales, we had to have a two door. Uh, so pretty clearly up front, it was, you're going to need both of them to kind of make a business uh, case out of that. Gotcha. So as far as the capability and, and price point, because price point is key to this thing. And it starts honestly fairly conservatively. Which is which is pretty good because you've got that younger buyer now that goes, oh, I can, wow, well, I can afford this. This is pretty cool, right? right. Um, but on top of that, it seems that even if you buy a base model Bronco, right, the cheapest one you could buy, that off-road capability is still very much. Like I was watching videos of even the Bronco Sport going up stuff in mine. Mm -hmm. I was like, holy crap! I'm like, they like these are super super capable trucks, even if they're not the top of the range model. Right, right. Yeah. So again, just back to what's what's the DNA or what makes a Bronco a Bronco and that off-road capability kind of over any terrain was super important. These aren't going to be just, you know, look tough. They have to perform. Uh, so it's everything from the capability to, again, making sure these things are bulletproof durable. So we're torturing yeah. these things out there at Moab and Johnson Valley and Rubicon Trail, wherever we can find and um you know one thing we're really proud about on the on the bronco two and four door is the 35 inch tires yeah. and, and you know typically you do that you know post sale and uh we got it directly from the factory and we've got it on every single uh series on the bronco uh all seven series you can get the the 35 inch tires whether it be that base you know really? vehicle that starts at twenty yeah. eight thousand five hundred or the sixty thousand dollar first edition you can get 35 inch tires from the factory on any series because these vehicles are like, uh, customers told us it was like an adult Lego, right? They just want to be able to right. make a match. <laughs> That's a great point. Their own. Yeah. And so yeah. it was all about making these things modular from day one. Um, it's, so it's easy to take off doors and tops and fender flares and, you know, everything can basically, even the grill can be easily kind of swapped out, uh, obviously all kinds of accessories. So we tried to almost come in with the mindset of how do I build a, a Lego for adults here? 
that also seemed like a really it i noticed one of the first things i thought of when i went kind of went through the website right and looking at all these all the different accessories you can get it it had this this air of you know what we would consider the old days and not growing up with this ourselves obviously but like the idea of accessorizing something right from the showroom yeah. floor you know, yeah. like right there on the showroom floor, like going in and just like, okay, I'm going to order this and that and that and this. I'm going to customize this thing bef- and take delivery of a custom factory machine, right? Yeah. That's for people like us. That's that's what we've heard of from our parents, right? We yeah. don't know that world, you know? Right. Yeah. So there's there's still a ton more um, that's coming that we haven't yet, you know, been able to fully reveal in terms of you know the 200 plus accessories and the level of modularity on the vehicle. So. There's, there's a ton more coming, uh, even than what we've been able to show, right? There's just so much to, to talk about. We've got to do it in chunks here. But um, that was kind of the mindset of, we know people want to personalize these things. How do we make that uh, easier uh, for the customer? And that right. was full on this. When, when you were guys, were, when you were bringing this forth, right? Was there anybody at Ford that didn't because i know you guys ran into a lot of resistance when this was coming right just because yeah. when ford made the announcement we're going to all kind of cuvs we're stopping sedans everybody just kind of went oh shit all right here we go what's what's going on um did because of the oj thing back in the day mm-hmm. was there any type of pushback to be like no the bronco name is tainted we don't like this where i mean for us as enthusiasts like Hearing the word Bronco only meant one thing. You knew it was a Ford or it just didn't exist. Mm-hmm. So how was, how was it, you know, what did corporate it, think? Yeah, so um, that did uh, certainly come up. Uh, and, um, you know, there was some debate. And, you know, with debate, you know, you either can try to just talk louder or you can go try to get some more data uh, on that. So we went out and, of course, we did some more research, right, because we're – big company and doing a lot of this a big investment. So we literally did uh, some research and it's pretty unique on this particular topic uh, where we brought in a bunch of customers. They didn't know they were there for automotive research that we were Ford. They just all came in, had no idea what we were really talking about. And the moderator uh, who was very trained in this area literally just had a, a flipboard, right? A paper and just wrote one word up on the flipboard, just said Bronco. They didn't know if it was Denver Broncos or Ford Bronco, right. or Bronco horse or what, what it was. And they couldn't talk to each other. And they literally, you know, had a couple uh, assignments where they would just start writing down what came to mind for them uh, when we wrote the word Bronco, right? You mm-hmm. know, was it Denver Bronco or John Elway or who knows whatever. Sure. And uh, then they go through a whole series of exercises where they group those ideas together. They start telling stories about, you know, Bronco, but they never see a vehicle. It's never mentioned that it's Ford. And they just talk about what the name Bronco means to them. And for us, that was a great way to understand, you know, what, um, you know, what the name Bronco still meant to today's Mm -hmm. consumer. And basically the bottom line was the Bronco name still stood for the things that, you know, it had always stood for. And OJ and that, um, you know, experience was frankly just a very small piece of the overall what Bronco and the name stood for. Right. And it frankly did not, in total, did not negatively impact the name or tarnish the name. Um, there was certainly an association um, with it, but in the big picture, it was relatively small and it surprised a lot of people internally just how strong the name still was and how little that, you know, very unfortunate incident um, really impacted the overall Bronco brand. Right. When, so I guess it was back in, God, I want to say 2013, 2012, something along those lines. Um, there was a concept Bronco that came out and subsequently appeared in that movie Rampage with Dwayne right. and Johnson and stuff yeah. like that. Yeah. Um, I mean, that was a slick looking thing. Was that a little bit of a marketing push to be like, guys, we, we, you know, it might, it's not, not going to be this, but understand that something is coming. Yeah. I think it was a way uh, to, it was back in 2004 and that was, Oh, really was that flat long ago? Wow. Yeah. yeah it was really old. cool. If we're talking the same one, that was the one we are rampage movie. Yes, um, exactly. Yep. And uh, 
so basically it was you know it was a way again to kind of keep the the name and the interest uh, mm-hmm. alive and to try to fuel the what we call the dream of bringing bronco back um, that particular concept frankly did not have a lot of uh, opportunity to actually go into production it wasn't you know really practical in terms of its design it didn't have the underlying what we call a kind of platform and stuff mm-hmm. to build it from it was pretty stretchy in terms of a concept uh, but the reaction was super positive to say oh boy everybody loved the design and you know yep. what it could be and so it gave just another shot in the arm to say boy we we really got something here on bronco but really the stars kind of had to align in terms of you got to have a, a platform, right? The chassis to kind of build from right. you have a plant that has open capacity. Um, and you got to have senior leadership and funding uh, to kind of go do this. So for us, it, when we moved focus out of Michigan assembly plant and uh, the decision was made to bring Ranger back into the market, yeah, we knew that that was, that was the opening that we needed to do a Bronco because it was a body on frame. We had capacity in the plant. Coincidentally, Michigan assembly is where all Broncos have always been produced. I mean, it just, cool. the, the stars were aligning. Yeah. And uh, we said, you know, at that point in the meeting, I can remember to this day about, um, you know, a little over five years ago, we said, can we do whatever we want with this second product? And the leadership said, yeah, you can, whatever you want, you know, do a Ranger and something else. And that was, Christmas, if you will, for Bronco, because we knew, you know, this was what we needed to bring Bronco back. Did and they have any idea that you, what you were plant, what you were scheming? They had you that to you. That, <laughs> right? I mean, that's, <laughs> that sounds insane, right? It was, you know, it was, it was something that folks wanted to bring back forever, even inside the company. I mean, the customers, right, were literally begging for to bring it back, but they yeah. didn't want us to screw it up, right? They didn't want it to be another CUV. And like a uh, blazer, I'll say that because I hate <laughs> it so much. So yeah, go ahead. So uh, for us, it was, you know, this was, we knew there was a customer. We would literally, even for years prior to that, we would be talking every year, like, you know, what does the future showroom want to be? And it was like, well, we want a Bronco. And it, that was going on for a decade, you know, and finally, leadership was almost getting so tired of it. it was like, don't even talk about it anymore. It's not going to happen. And then when we had the opportunity to bring it back, it was like, all right, this is our chance. We can't, we can't screw it up now. And uh, you know, then the work really began at that point. Mark, I've got a, re- you, you touched on something there and it's been a word that I've been thinking about with Ford for a while now, because I keep, I keep hearing about um, just, you know, how Ford is focused on the future of transportation, what that looks like, right? I mean, I, I really was a big fan of what Ford did with Vice a couple of years ago when they talked about just automobility and what trucks might look like in the future and smart roads and all this amazing mm-hmm. stuff, right? Yeah. One of the things that as we here we are at Hemmings and talking to you from our, you know, our, our uh, underground layers here with <laughs> our old stuff surrounding us, um, you know, we love historical stuff, right? We love yeah. old cars and classics and things. How does the Bronco in your mind fit into this larger, you know, Ford push that we keep hearing about for like the future of everything, you know? That seems like a pretty interesting place to be because we've all got our own opinions about it. I know I certainly have mine. And there's obviously, obviously you guys think there's a place for this here, right? But in the future, I mean, I know you're not looking at this as just a 2020 year of the Rona launch. You're looking like down the road with Bronco. What's the future of Bronco look like to you? That's a great question. Yeah, no, that's a really uh, deep and interesting question, right? It's, uh, Do you want me to turn the lights down? I could turn the lights down a little bit. More. <laughs> Just, yeah, no, that's, that's, make some tea. It's a tough question. I'm trying to buy time for a good answer here for you uh, <laughs> on that one. Um, but, you know, I think it's, there's still going to be this customer um, that wants to get back into the outdoors, that wants a really capable vehicle. Uh, so things will change in the, in the future and you're trying to have one foot in the present and one in the future. Um, but I think the customer um, is still going to be there. And, um, you know, it's, I think the opportunity for us with this new Bronco, because we were out of the market for so long, is we did have the opportunity to stretch a little bit more uh, on it. And how can we bring in some more modern technology um, to yeah. the vehicle? So, you know, cameras and 
um, you know, even our off-road uh, mapping system that we're going to have and uh, what we call our GOAT modes, our train management system, and how can we make um, it easier um, for people to, to have a vehicle like this. What we saw is a lot of customers, frankly, um, were buying a vehicle like this because they aspired to have that image or that lifestyle. But quite frankly, they did not actually do it that much. And so for right. a lot of customers, they were one and done where they owned that vehicle. And then maybe because the everyday drivability wasn't good, or the water leaks, or just because right. they never really took the top and the doors off, they said, eh, that was fun, but I'm gonna do something else. So we thought with you know technology and innovation, there was a real opportunity to offer a more modern um, vehicle. It could still have some of those classic kind of cues, but you know what? It's got EcoBoost engines, it's got you know camera systems and 10 speed right. automatics, it's got all the driver assist technology it's got all that but it's also just got you know kind of the basics that you want um in that classic vehicle so try to find the right blend on that one i got one big giant question i've been dying to ask you mark how many sawzall blades will i have to go to to shove a godzilla th crate motor <laughs> into that into that bronco like, what's that going to take? I just, you mean, we don't, that maybe you can just think about that. You don't even have to answer the question at this point. Uh, that's, that is a good one. You're probably not the only one. Uh, yeah. Maybe it's, you know, maybe it's the uh, Coyote engine as well, or maybe yeah. it's the seven, yeah. but you know what, maybe that'll, uh, I'm sure people will be, uh, be looking at that. So. Well, if everything goes right, I'll come back to you with an answer. How's that sound? That's there awesome. you go. Like, okay. All right. Sounds good. There you go. <laughs> Well, let me ask you. So we know it obviously it's built on the, the kind of the Ranger platform and whatnot. When you torture test these things, right? Because, you, you know, when people see the Bronco, no roof, no doors, holes in the floor, so they could basically hose it off, right. right? And yet you have this massive digital screen, this readout screen that tells you every, anything and everything you want to know, right? Right. When we think about that from an automotive perspective, it's like, okay, well, we have our sealed bubbles that are driving down the road and they're fine. This is a completely unsealed bubble that can be open to the elements that can go through water, through mud, through anything and over anything. How much, like the torture testing on that must be so much more severe to make sure that everything, not only, I mean, bombing through the desert at speed to make sure stuff not only doesn't rattle apart, but how do you keep it watertight? I know that might seem like a very elementary question, but like, seriously, like, how do you, how do, you do that? Yeah, no, we got some... Uh... Crazy smart engineers and designers is is my short answer on that one. Um, they're definitely, you know, looking at all that. And to your point, torture testing, it, try and find the most extreme conditions that they can put it through because they know the customer is going to do the same. So, you know, we literally start with our B BFT, our Built Ford Tough testing, and then kind of take it to the off-road uh, trails from there. But you know, the, the water uh, intrusion or concern was to me, one of my favorite stories of the whole development, because to your point, the whole part of the fun of a vehicle like this is you take the doors and the top off, but you know what, whether it be a, a quick rain shower or whatever, it's going to get wet. It's going to get muddy. And, yeah. um, you know, from our expert panel, actually, I think it um, was one of the key inputs is, they said, look, we don't want the stuff shorting out, um, you know, on all this, uh, all the electronics. And so we silicone coated all the key kind of uh, controls. So when it does get wet or get sand in it, you're not going to have to worry about those shorting out on you. And okay. um, that was kind of, to me, like one of the cool kind of innovations uh, on that to say, look, we got a plan for people um, to get this stuff wet and dirty. And mm -hmm. how do you engineer and design that? Um, so it's going to, you know, meet their expectations on that. And I think, again, our, our team just did such a magnificent job of that. Everything from the silicone coating on the actual, what we call hero switches, like your lockers and your stay bar disconnect. Yep. But they also just put those controls right up on the top of the instrument panel because right when you're wanting those controls, you don't want to hunt and peck for it. where is that right. button? Right. And so our experts said you need that right in the line of sight and easy to access. And those to me were some of the the 
the best examples of uh, you know kind of the engineers really understanding the the customer and what what they needed, even if they didn't have it today or couldn't even tell you. If you can just right. get back to this is the the air state that we see. Again, I take off the doors and I don't have mirrors. Well, I'm going to put the mirrors on the body, so right. then I can still see what's behind me and stuff like mm -hmm. that. It's just simple it's stuff like that. Yeah that um there's just dozens of stories on that so all right then i you have to forgive me for, because i i forget what what ford calls it but the the actual trail turn where one of the wheels basically yeah. locked how did that come up because i saw that on the video and i was like that is simply ingenious right so dan i, I don't know if you've seen this but it, it can it almost looks like it pivots and it's it's unreal so how, who came up with that how did that happen yeah, I don't, uh, you know, again, that was our, our engineers. I think it was, you know, looking at, hey, you got some of these tight trails and it's an, something that an expert or even a novice can really benefit from. And, you know, you've got all these new electronics on the vehicle, right? So how can you use that uh, to make it easier for, for off-roading? And so basically it's our trail turn assist. Uh, so you got that right. It basically locks uh, with the press of a button, the inside rear tire and almost like a tank, you're just pivoting. Yeah. Uh, around right. That. And so instead of doing a three or four or five point turn, you're just pressing that bu button and it just pivots. you can just pivot right mm, around there. So and, cool. Uh, it just makes off-roading and stuff like that so much easier and frankly, more fun. There, there's another one that, um, might be even cooler, even more unique. It's uh, like a, a one pedal driving for off-roading. So you might've heard of this on some of the electric vehicles now, right? Where you can just use yep. a single pedal when you take yeah, off your foot, yeah, yeah. it slows down, right? Yep. So in the off-road space, imagine if you're on something pretty uh, treacherous, like some rocks and you're having one foot on the gas and one on the brake. Um, now with the one pedal off-road mode, you basically, when you take your foot off the gas um, in that mode, it applies the brakes. And so you don't have to, you know, double foot the, yep. the gas and the, uh, and the brake to kind of go over that. You just focus on the one pedal. It just makes it so much easier right. um, to do. So um, all kinds of fun stuff like that. I will say that the, the, um, the brake assist, that thing, that also sounds like somebody on staff had a, has a dad like mine who owns a 1942 Ford 2N uh, tractor. Cause I had, I learned growing up how to actually do one of those turns at the end of a row, you know, on a field and just right. pivot you right around and it just, you hit that one break. <laughs> Donut mode. That's yeah. absolutely right. <laughs> at, at three, at three miles an hour. Right. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Mark, were you surprised? So when the Raptor came out, were you surprised by the amount of abuse that your customers inflicted on those trucks? Because when they came out, you saw people doing stuff that was just like, oh, my God, like they paid a lot of money and they are just beating these things into the ground. Right. So were you are you always surprised when you see either videos or you read about stuff? and You're like, I can't believe those sons of bitches. Yeah, I feel like I, I feel like Ford, <laughs> Ford should trademark the term world star, because every time you'd see one of these things <laughs> launch on a video, you hear world star, you know, <laughs> Uh, yeah, I don't know if I would say surprise, but uh, you definitely uh, take notice. Uh, and uh, just like you guys, you're, you're watching that. But, um, you know, you know, um, quite frankly, on some of these vehicles that, you know, you, they're going to they're going to really push it to the extremes. Right. They're almost going to yeah. use these vehicles. And um, I think, you know, for Ford, I worked, you know, a decade on trucks that you know, you're basically that built for tough really means something that, yeah. you know, these trucks, they know that these trucks are super tough and durable. Um, and, you know, just like the Bronco will be. And, uh, you know, because whether it be something as crazy on a Raptor or just, you know, on a construction site, as far as how much they're going to be loading up these vehicles and the towing right. and stuff like that, that, you know, really just trying to make sure we're um, testing and engineering for this most extreme customer, not just the one driving to the mall, but the one that, you know, when it's time to count on these Drive, vehicles. Drives over they, the mall. Yeah. Yeah. yeah <laughs> these, these things need to be ready in case you ever, you know, do have the apocalypse. Uh, that yeah. These, these things are ready. What, and I, I don't know if this was released, but um, have you guys released any toe specs on this thing yet as far as capacities? 
Yeah, so it's uh, 3,500 pounds on both the two and the four door. And okay. uh, so it's, you know, it's a small, you know, kind of small boat trailer. Yeah, um, yeah. You know, and I think we're listening, Camper. to be quite honest, as far as some customers saying, hey, do they need a little bit more and stuff like that. But, right. Um, you know, for now, it's 3,500 on both the two and the four door. Okay. Um, what, as far as the going back to the name itself, right? Yeah. Um, and and the amount that you put into developing the aftermarket side of this, how many of the consumers from what you've seen will still go to the aftermarket and say, well, I think they built a better mass trap when in reality, like if a bike rack or canoe rack, the doors, the mirrors, everything that was literally developed by Ford, is there a point where you look to the aftermarket and say, oh, okay, these guys really do know what they're doing and take cues from them? Or do you find now, since you've done so much engineering that the aftermarket is looking at you guys and be like, oh, shit, we can't really, we're not going to out-engineer Ford on this one. We should probably just, you know. Yeah, no, that's uh, that's another good question. That's a point for you on a, another tough question on that one. So <laughs> that, you know, I think on the one hand, um, when it comes to personalization, um, there's a point where, you know, some people just want something different uh, on that. So even yeah. though if, you, if you've got a great offering from, quote, the factory, some people just don't want that. They want something more unique. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, there's also some areas that, quite frankly, what Ford with an accessory is going to do is just simply going to be a different market or customer than some of the aftermarket. They're hitting all kinds of price points and all different types of quality uh, and engineering levels on that. And, you know, there's, there's just different customers. Some want the one that's been engineered to fit with the vehicle. It's covered under warranty and they can finance it. And, um, you know, a little bit, let's be honest, probably a higher quality. And some people are like, oh, I don't value that as much. And I, I want some right. uh, in the aftermarket. So we're never going to cover everything from, from the factory in terms of accessories. I think there's, sure certainly an opportunity that we can do a lot more because for a lot of customers, um, frankly, that don't wrench on their truck, it, they want to customize it, but it can be a little bit intimidating in terms of the customization. Yeah. Which one do I pick and how do I install it? So I think, you know, there's a lot of opportunity for Bronco on that. Okay. Um, all right. So we're, we're running out of time right now. So I just want to ask you a couple more questions for Dan's sure. another one as well. So, how many years now have you been at Ford? I've been at Ford for uh, 24 years. Okay. So you've wanted to build the Bronco for how many years? A large part of that. Uh, okay. Yeah. yeah. So would you say that this is one of like your, your crowning achievements? It's given what you've seen in the technology space where everything is going from kind of hardcore trucks where it used to be back in the day to yeah. kind of you know we went through the sedan phase now we're in the cuv phase how how good do you feel that you guys came out with another kick-ass truck that everybody wanted yeah no it, it uh i think i've got one of the best jobs uh right now certainly um one of the best jobs i've had i've had a lot of cool stuff to work on in my uh time at ford but um this is this was pretty unique um so i got to work on the bronco since before it even became an official program uh trying to bring it back actually developing the strategy for this one working on it for several years and you know what do we need to do and then now in my current role um kind of lead the marketing launch of it so it's a uh, it's a pretty cool uh, experience that um, can't really be topped. And, um, you know, just knowing all the challenges, I'll call it that, um, that the team faced in terms of convincing, um, you know, leadership that this was the right product to bring back in a time when the market, frankly, was going in a different direction. Yeah. Um, and there had been a lot of talk about it. You know, why now? Why should we really do this? And, you know, just frankly, there was a lot of, concern rightfully so that enthusiasts were like yeah i've heard about this and i've been teased before you guys aren't going to do it and if you do it you're going to screw it up and right. you know that literally drove the team morning and night to say we cannot screw this up we've got yeah. to deliver on this and um you know it feels really good that 
Um, the team uh, was just so focused on the brand and the customer. Uh, we've got something truly special. I mean, I'm, we're not going to stop and celebrate now because, you know, we know it's, we got to launch the product and, you know, we got to make this thing successful, not just for the first year or two, but sure. how do we make this thing successful for decades. And so while we're super happy, we're, we've got a, we're now on to the next phase of uh, that's going to keep us plenty busy for, for years to come. And there's, there's so much more coming on the Bronco. We haven't been able to talk about yet. You guys, if you're blown away by this, you're, you're not going to believe some of the other stuff that's coming. Oh man. Well, that kind of brings up a question I've had and, you know, across the board, but I get to ask you this question. I mean, how, what, what, what did you think was going to happen as you're getting ready to launch this thing after all these years of thinking about it and scheming yeah. it and loving it and hating it and you know everything else and then the year of the rona hits at the same time you're going to launch this sucker i mean what like how did you even like how do you not just jump off a cliff when that comes, when this, when <laughs> yeah. this happened it was close to it right i think i went through the don't they say the different uh stages of five stage? stages of the, yeah <laughs> right yeah <laughs> acceptance <laughs> right like <laughs> it, it was painful right the shock <laughs> anger and um, oh yeah we had been working on just the reveal of it for forever and we had you know it wasn't just a traditional reveal we had a super cool plan of what we were going to do that was going to be equally as epic that we had worked on for far over a year, you know, it was, we had four different events and it was, it was going to be awesome. And then all of a sudden, each one of them started to get canceled. Um, oh, and yeah. like, oh man. And then we might know a little late. bit about that. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. So maybe, maybe the next one was going to still happen. And then, you know, you were trying to, on the one hand, be ready in case something miraculously changed and you could still continue to do some of those versus, oh, all right, we got to go back to square one and rethink right. it. Right. And it was everything from, you know, quite frankly, how do you get, you know, how do you do something like this, but it's over, you know, a digital instead of an in-person. Right. And, you know, we're trying to be outdoors, but yet we're going to do it over the internet. And, you know, and then quite frankly, people had other things they were worried about instead of a new vehicle launch. Uh, right. So what was the right timing? Because probably didn't really have the attention span of the of the media and the customers to be talking about, hey, look at our new vehicle. When again, there's other more pressing things going on. So mm -hmm. we, you know, really had to, we went through a, a lot of shock and you know frustration to say, look, we really got to go back to the drawing board there, and um, you know, tried to think about how to do that, teamed up with the Disney Channel and Networks, teamed up with Jimmy Chin, um, and, uh, you know, basically tried to do the, the reveal that way. And, um, you know, may, who knows what will happen in the future reveals, but for this one, it uh, I think it exceeded everybody's expectations. Yeah. And, um, you know, the buzz, the buzz is clearly out there, and it broke through. Uh, and yeah, that's great. Yeah. The timing yeah. obviously worked, and it wasn't just – um, you know, hey, because people are sheltered in place that, all oh, right, now Bronco is a success. You can literally see five, six years ago when we started this project that people wanted to get back into the outdoors. This is a right. trend that's been going on for a long time. And you'd see stats like 94% of the average American's time is spent indoor or in their vehicle. And they yeah. want to just, you know, put aside the technology for a second Let's get back out in the nature and a vehicle like Bronco is what you need to, to do that. That's a good yeah. point. Okay. So one final question, except we got to wrap up. When are we going to see these things in person? When can we order them? When can we pick them up? When g give me, give me a date, give me something. You, when you're we not call my wife so I can put the pocket <laughs> down. Yeah. I'll, I'll get you hooked up. <laughs> so you can put in you can put in your reservation uh, right now for the Bronco tour or Ford, or you can go to Ford.com. We've got over 165,000 reservations. It's a hundred bucks. I would encourage folks to do that now because you want to get your place in line. Uh, the yep. actual ordering on the Bronco two and four door will open in December of this year. Okay. And then the very first uh, Bronco two and four doors will start arriving uh, next spring of uh, 2021. 
And um, we'll start to have more Broncos available for people to see once events start, uh, you know, uh, happening again, whether yep. it be auto shows or, or different events uh, that you can go and check them out in person. Um, and then we didn't talk much today about it, but uh, this Bronco Sport, which is kind of the entry into the Broncos yeah. family, that's available for ordering right now. And that'll arrive in dealerships at the end of this year. Oh, perfect. Great. All right. Well, yeah. Mark, thank you so much for coming yeah, on Mark, with you. I, this is really cool. And, and uh, congratulations for kind of bringing your, your dream back to the market. We, I know we thank you. The enthusiast yeah. is going to thank you. <laughs> As true. a Bronco owner, I can't wait to, <laughs> to get my hands on one of these. Um, so yeah, man, thanks so much. Yeah, Mark, Mark, we wish you all the best awesome. with the Bronco. Make sure to let us know what we could do at Hemmings to help you guys push this thing out because we think it's awesome. No, we, I uh, really appreciate the time and it was enjoyable talking to both of you and we appreciate what you guys and enthusiasts do because without you, we would not be bringing this product back. So we hope we've done it right for you guys and uh, we're looking forward to a lot more fun and a lot more news coming in the future. Very cool. All right, awesome. man. We will talk to you soon. Thanks again, Mark. All right. See you guys. See you, Mark. All right. Be well. Yeah.